want you to understand, if not all, then most charismatic preachers are counterfeit preachers. Just because they stand up with a Bible in their hands, just because they say Jesus and preach in the name of Jesus, as we have seen in another Bible study, there is another Jesus, there is another gospel, there is another spirit. So what makes you think just because they stand up in the name of Jesus and claim to be preaching the gospel and claim to have the power of the Holy Ghost, that it's all from God? No. When what they preach and teach goes dead against this book, they cannot be preachers sent by God. They are counterfeit preachers. They are under the control of the Roman Catholic Church. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. We will read verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So here you have the officers appointed by God for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So firstly, you have apostles. Then you have prophets. Then you have evangelists. And you have pastors and teachers, which are the same office, pastor, teacher. Every pastor should be able to teach, should be apt to teach. So you have these four things that the Lord has given for the perfecting of the saints, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the work of the ministry. What does the devil do? He goes ahead and counterfeits all these things. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and we'll read verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles. So there you have the devil's counterfeit false apostles. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. So God has his evangelists and pastors. The devil has his ministers. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24. For there shall be false Christs and false prophets. There you have. The devil imitates everything God does. God has his men who have been given to edify the church and to do the work of the ministry. And the devil brings in his own ministers. And they don't go separately outside somewhere and start another religion. They infiltrate the church. Always remember that. One of the greatest uh, devices of the devil is infiltration. There are false apostles, false ministers, false Christs and false prophets. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2 we read, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. Even here in the early days of the church, there were false apostles uh, in the apostolic church, early church. You have false apostles in Revelation 2 and verse 2. We read that. And what did they do? They tried to deceive people. And the same thing is done once again in the future after the church is raptured. Once the church is uh, raptured, the tribulation begins and it continues at least for uh, seven years and that's the time when the Antichrist and the false prophet are there on the earth deceiving millions of people. And look at what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and righteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. These people will be there again in the tribulation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I want you to see how even in the early church period itself 
they were false apostles. They were the apostles of Jesus Christ and they were false apostles imitating the true apostles, ministers, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. That's the devil's tactic that he counterfeits what God does. Now the apostles, the true apostles of Jesus Christ had been given signs by which you could identify that these are the apostles of Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Look at that. Signs wonders mighty deeds these are the signs that were given to the apostles these were the signs by which you could identify the true apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ they were signs wonders and mighty deeds now the question is what were this uh, what were these signs wonders and mighty deeds look at mark chapter 16 mark chapter 16 we will read verses 17 to 20 and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out devils they will cast out devils what the charismatic preachers claim to do today they shall speak with new tongues and we'll talk a little bit more about tongues later. Verse 18, they shall take up serpents. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Then you have these people drinking poison, let us say. And it will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. They would heal. Heal the sick. And they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. You see, these are the signs that God had given to the apostles by which you could identify them as apostles they could cast out devils speak with new tongues take up serpents and they would not be hurt drink deadly uh, poison and it would not hurt them they could heal the sick and these were the signs that God had given to the apostles by which you could identify them now the question is why did God give the apostles these signs and wonders and mighty deeds Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and we'll read verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Look at that. The Jews require a sign. Now the new uh, English versions, the modern versions have changed the word require in, in most English version, uh, versions to demand. And they say the Jews demand a sign what is the problem with that the problem is they make it look like the Jews are unjustly demanding something that does not belong to them they are demanding God to give them something God doesn't want to give them no it's not like that the Jews require a sign that means they need signs wonders and mighty deeds in order for them to believe in God without that it would become difficult for them to believe. Now let me show what I'm saying. Look at Exodus chapter 4. We'll read verses 28 to 31. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him. And all the signs which he had commanded him. God had given signs to Moses to perform before Israel. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. And did the signs in the sight of the people. Note that down in your Bible. It says, and Moses did the signs in the sight of the people. Why? The Jews require a sign. 
And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel. And it goes on. The people believed it says. The people believed. What did they believe? They believed in God when they saw the signs and wonders and mighty deeds performed by Moses. You see brethren that the nation of Israel was built on the very foundation of signs, wonders and mighty deeds. Remember all the mighty deeds and signs that God had to perform before Israel in the wilderness journey. Before they could truly believe in God. He had to perform miracle after miracle after miracle. In order for them to believe that he truly brought them out of bondage from the land of Egypt. So the Jews require a sign. And the nation of Israel was built on the very foundation of signs, wonders and mighty deeds. So what we understand from this is very simple. The Jews require a sign. And God has given signs to the apostles. So that tells you that God had given these signs, wonders and mighty deeds to the apostles. So that they could perform them before the Jews. Who would see those signs and then believe that Jesus Christ indeed is the son of God. Who is God manifest in the flesh. Who had come to redeem them. That was God's purpose in giving signs and wonders and mighty deeds to the apostles. Because the apostles primarily uh, ministered to the Jews in the early days of the church. And that's why they had all those miracles and signs and uh, wonders to perform. So as we have seen, the devil performs all these things again in the tribulation. We have read in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10 that the devil does all uh, sorts of workings in the earth with power, signs and lying wonders. So here you have the devil's work in the tribulation done with power, signs and wonders. Charismatic Christians think anybody who can perform a miracle is doing it with the power of God. They don't see in the scriptures that there are false apostles who can perform false miracles. In the tribulation, the Antichrist and the false prophet will perform great signs and wonders with great power and deceive the people of the earth, especially the Jews, at least for three and a half years into believing that the Antichrist is none other than their Messiah. And what makes you think if the devil could imitate the ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ and imitate the signs of the apostles that he cannot be doing that for the past hundred years in the charismatic church. That's exactly what he's been doing. You know what he's doing? He's conditioning the minds of the people of this world to believe in the Antichrist. Because when he comes, he comes with the same power, signs and lying wonders that these charismatic preachers claim to possess today. So they are conditioning the minds of these people. Maybe in these charismatic churches there are millions of unsaved people. Who think they are Christians because of some experience that they have had. So here you have these unsaved people in the charismatic churches. And when the church is raptured, when the true church is raptured, they are left behind. So what happens? They see this great man... A great God come down to the earth with great power, signs and wonders. What would these charismatics do? They would immediately believe him to be Jesus Christ. Because their pastor has always taught them that the power that he had to perform signs and wonders were from God. And when the Antichrist and the false prophet do the same things, they would believe in them. You see, the charismatic movement is not just some false teaching in a few things. It's a whole movement towards hell. That's what it is. If not for all charismatics, at least for the majority of them. I know that there are many born-again charismatic Christians. Very godly, very sincere, no doubt about that. And we can always appreciate the zeal that these charismatics possess. But sadly, that is zeal without knowledge. And they have zeal for wrong things. But there are a majority of charismatics who think they are born again Christians when they are not. Because they have never trusted in the gospel of the grace of God in the death, resurrection, 
uh, death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have trusted in a miracle. They have trusted in some uh, healing or something for their salvation. And sadly they are unsaved people who believe that they are saved. A great delusion is coming upon the earth in the days of the tribulation. If you are not a born again Christian, you will be left behind and you could fall prey to that great deception that is coming in the tribulation which has already begun now in the form of the charismatic movement. Now in this connection I would like to also say a few things about the so-called gift of tongues. Now we cannot go in depth on this subject just like we didn't go in depth about signs and wonders but we are only, look, uh, we are only going to look at the foundation and once you understand the very uh, rudiments of these doctrines and you don't even really need to get into the details you will be able to understand yourself when you read the Bible on that subject so we will talk briefly about the gift of tongues look at Acts chapter 2 verses 4 to 8 Acts chapter 2 verses 4 to 8 we are going to read this long passage but before that let me just make a few points very very clear to you there are only three times in the entire Bible where the gift of tongues are exercised. Only three times. That would be, as I'm sure you know, in Acts 2, in Acts 10, and Acts 19. These are the only three places in the Bible where somebody is speaking in tongues. And outside of the book of Acts, only in the book of 1st Corinthians does Paul ever mention the gift of tongues. Nowhere else in Paul's epistles will you find anything said about the gift of tongues. So that tells you it's not a very major thing as far as God is concerned. He doesn't talk a lot about that. Uh, the, we are going to answer two questions. What was the gift of tongues and what was the purpose mainly of the gift of tongues? So in order to answer the first question, what was the gift of tongues? Let us read Acts chapter 2 verses 4 to 8. On the day of Pentecost, it says in verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and, uh, and began to speak with other tongues. It's called other tongues. Well, I know that in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about unknown tongues. We'll get to that as well. But before that, let's look at what these tongues were. Uh, with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, verse 5, And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Underline the word Jews. Verse 6, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, that is the multitude of Jews, uh, and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. You see how the scripture interprets itself. In verse 4, the other tongues are called languages. They are called languages in verse 6. Look at verse 7, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, not, are not all these which speak Galileans? That means they are saying, the people who are speaking are actually uh, Israelites who belong to Galilee, and they have their own dialect. Okay, read verse 8. And how hear we every man in our own tongue? That means in our own language, wherein we were born. How can these Galileans who have their own language speak in our languages? And if you see there, you have a long list of countries from where these Jews had come to appear before God at the time of the Feast of Pentecost. The apostles who spoke in tongues spoke in other languages. That means the gift of tongues is the ability to speak in a language that you have not learned. It is the supernatural ability given by God to preach in a language that is not learned by the speaker. That is very important to understand. As soon as you get this clear, you can stop talking about this whole uh, uh, doctrine of tongues. You don't have to talk one thing because you know the charismatics are completely wrong about this subject. 
Because the gibberish they claim to be the gift of tongues is not the biblical gift of tongues. Because in the Bible, the gift of tongues is the supernatural ability to speak in a language which has not been learned. Why is that? It's very simple to understand. You see, the church was in its infancy. That was the birth of the church. And the church had to spread to all the world. Remember what Jesus said to the apostles. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. They had to go everywhere. But how could they go to the whole world and preach the gospel? Because remember in Genesis chapter 11. God uh, confounded the languages of the people at the Tower of Babel. In other words, the gift of tongues is a reversal of the curse that God had put on mankind and their languages at the Tower of Babel. There he confounded the languages. Here he is giving the supernatural ability to speak all the languages so that the church would spread throughout the world so that the gospel of the grace of God could be preached throughout the world. But later on we know when missionaries from England especially and other parts of Europe like Germany and other places went throughout the world they would first go and learn the languages of that country to which they have gone as missionaries. Why is that? Because the gift of tongues had ceased. That is why. And then they had to learn the language and then preach the gospel to the people in their own language. It's, it's common sense. There's not a great big doctrine that you need to sit and break your head over. It's very simple to understand. God has not complicated it at all. It's these charismatics who have completely perverted the truth on this gift of tongues. So God gave the ability to speak in a different language. That's what the gift of tongues was all about. Tongues is not some private prayer language as the charismatics claim. And they of course run to 1 Corinthians 14. Let's look at a couple of verses which should be enough to clarify all confusion on this subject about tongues being a private prayer language. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit, spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now the charismatics would take this verse and verse 14 put them together and say look you cannot understand what I'm saying because I'm speaking mysteries in the spirit. It's a private prayer language. God has given me the ability to speak. And what are they saying? That gibberish that they speak is supposedly the gift of tongues. A private prayer language. By the way, if you are in India, you would know that the words that these people use while they exercise the so-called gift of tongues are the same words that you find people who are demon-possessed using. I don't know if you have seen it, but in some of these festivals here in India, when they, they claim that the God comes upon that particular woman uh, and she's dancing and she's out of control, she says the same things that the charismatics say when they speak in tongues. That tells you this is another spirit, not the Holy Spirit at all who, who gives them this gift of tongues. But now let us examine 1 Corinthians 14 verse 2, the verse that we have just read. Firstly, I want you to look at the words unknown tongue that Paul uses. This has caused a great deal of confusion among Christians. Unknown tongue. What is an unknown tongue? It is a language which no one, including the speaker, could understand. That's why it's called an unknown tongue. It is a language, all right, just like English or Hindi or German, or uh, French, or any such language. An unknown tongue is an unknown language. Say, let's take for example, French. Now I can speak English, I can speak Hindi, I can speak the Telugu language, three languages. But I have no clue about French or German. And suddenly now, if I should start speaking to you in the German language, which I cannot understand, that would be an unknown tongue. Perhaps a German brother or sister who is watching it may understand me, but the others will not be able to understand it because they don't know German. It's as simple as that. That's what an unknown tongue is. A language uh, which is not learned. It's an unknown language. 
a language which is not known even to the speaker. Okay, in that verse, he goes on to say, uh, for he speaketh in an unknown tongue, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men but unto God. Now these are the words they, they take and say, when I say this gibberish, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to God. What exactly is Paul saying in these words? What he's saying is that it becomes, he speaks unto God, he speaks unto God, not because he's really speaking to God. It's because nobody can understand him. Not even he himself can understand what he's saying. But the language is known to God, right? Because it's a human language. It's not gibberish. By the way, the gibberish that the charismatic preach, uh, the, the, the charismatic sp uh, speak in, even God doesn't know what that language is. If there is one time God is totally uh, you know confounded it's when these people speak in that gibberish and claim to be speaking to God even God doesn't know what they are saying so Paul says when a person speaks in an unknown tongue that is in an unknown language he is speaking unto God because including himself nobody can understand what he's saying but maybe for example a Hebrew man is speaking in German so he doesn't understand it and his uh, audience doesn't understand him. Who understands him? God. So that means he's only speaking to God because nobody else can understand him. Because in the same verse, Paul makes this clear. This is not my explanation. This is what Paul is saying. He says in that verse, <clears throat> When he speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto men but unto God, for, look at that word there, for, because no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. That's why Paul is saying when you speak in an unknown tongue, you're speaking unto God and not unto men. Now he says, he goes ahead and says, how be it in the spirit. In the spirit. Now in the King James Bible, the word spirit there is not a capital S, but a small s. That is the human spirit. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says, There is the Spirit of God and there is the Spirit of the human being. The Spirit of God knows the things about God and the Spirit of man knows the things about man, Paul says. In the human spirit, it is not the Holy Spirit who is giving him that. In the human spirit, he is speaking mysteries. So once you understand this verse in this context... You can clearly see that Paul is not at all saying that speaking in gibberish is a gift from God. Not at all. Not once does the Bible say that the gift of tongues is the ability to speak in gibberish. I've heard some great innovations among charismatics nowadays to this gift of tongues. They are no longer like the old charismatics who had only a few words to say in the so-called gift of tongues. They had very limited words because, you see, they could not say much in that. They would keep repeating the same words again and again. But recently I heard one charismatic pastor and his wife speak in tongues for a good period of time, maybe about 10 minutes non-stop. And they did not repeat the words again and again. Now, I really appreciate their effort to, uh, you know, uh, that they have put in to improve the so-called gift of tongues. But sadly, they are deceiving themselves. The Bible never says that the gift of tongues is the ability to speak in gibberish, speak gibberish. It is the ability to speak a language which you have not learned. Even if you don't understand it. That's why in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul lays so much of emphasis on interpretation of tongues. He says if there is no one to interpret the gift of tongues, keep quiet. Don't talk. That should be enough for the charismatics, but no. They somehow get around all these things in the Bible and claim ultimately that this gibberish they are speaking is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So we have seen what is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the ability to speak in an unknown tongue. 1 Corinthians 14.14. 14. Now look at this in the light of what we have said here. 1 Corinthians 14.14. 14. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, 
but my understanding is unfruitful. What is Paul saying here? He's not saying, I speak in gibberish, that's why nobody can understand it. No. He's saying, if I preach in an unknown tongue, that is in a language even I don't understand, what happens? My spirit prayeth. That means in my human spirit, I am praying because those are words which make sense. Not to me, but to somebody somewhere in the world and certainly to God. But in the spirit, he says, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Because only God can understand me. I cannot understand what I am saying. Neither can the people in the church understand what I am saying. So there is no edification of the believers. My own understanding is unfruitful. In the light of 1 Corinthians 14.2, 1 Corinthians 14.14 14 becomes very easy to understand. Christians don't be deceived by the so-called gift of tongues. It is a supernatural ability to speak in a human language that has not been learned. A human language that has not been learned. But now let's answer the question, what was the purpose for the gift of tongues? Why did God give the gift of tongues to the early Christians in the early church age? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. <clears throat> Once again, 1 Corinthians 1.22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Now we have already seen this. That the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. The same principle applies to the gift of tongues. Because remember, speaking with new tongues, that is new languages, was part of the signs of the apostles which were given to the Jews. Because the Jews require a sign. Alright, now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we will read verse 22 in the light of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. Look at 1 Corinthians 14 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe but to them that believe not. Let's make this very very clear once for all. The Jews need a sign. Tongues are a sign. It's a sign to unbelievers. Now this is what the charismatic uh, preachers cash in on. They say it is a sign to unbelievers. That's why we have the gift of tongues. But who are these unbelievers according to Paul? Let us look at the context and you'll clearly understand who these unbelievers are that Paul is talking about. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 21. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, which are the Jews, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. That is the context of verse 22, verse 21. Paul is quoting an Old Testament verse which was spoken to the Jews by Isaiah and we will look at that verse as well. But before that, understand this. The Jews need a sign. Tongues were given as signs to unbelievers and those unbelievers again are Jews, not Gentiles. Look at Isaiah 28, 11 and 12. For with, with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest and this is the refreshing yet they would not hear. God said for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. That is the Jews. I am reading from Isaiah 28 and that's the verse Paul has quoted in 1 Corinthians 14.21. So in the context of 1 Corinthians 14.22 the unbelievers are Jews. So tongues are for a sign to the Jews, unbelieving Jews, to believe that Jesus is indeed their Messiah, who came down from heaven, who died for their sins, was buried and rose up again. That was the intention with which God gave tongues to the Jews, so that they could be a sign to the Jews to believe in Jesus Christ. Just as signs, wonders and mighty deeds were given uh, to the apostles so that the Jews could believe in Jesus Christ. 
The healings, the visions, everything have to do with Jews, brethren, not with Gentile Christianity. Not at all with Gentile Christianity. So we also see with all this that firstly, tongues were human languages. Secondly, human languages which they have not learned, they were able to speak in. And thirdly, this was done so that the Jews could believe that Jesus Christ is indeed their Messiah. Also remember this, that the gift of tongues was given to the Jews only do, uh, during the Acts time period. That means only during the time period of the book of Acts, which lasted, let's say, from 33 AD till about 62 AD when Paul died. Paul died in about 62 AD. And that is what the book of Acts covers. And the gift of tongues are only found within uh, this time period of the book of Acts. This is very, very important to understand. The book of Acts is a transitional book. Acts is transitional in nature. Why do you need to understand this? You need to understand it because it was a book that was... Uh, documenting a change in God's dealings with mankind. You see, in the book of Matthew, you see a transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That's why you find doctrines there which cannot be applied to the church. The book of Acts is a transition between God's dealing with the Jews to God's dealing with the Gentiles. That's why there are so many things in the book of Acts that you I find it difficult to understand. You find it difficult to understand. That's why you cannot take everything in the book of Acts as doctrine to the, to the Christian in the church age. Because Acts is a transitional book. It, is, it documents a change in God's dealings. Because God had been dealing with the Jews exclusively. But now he is going to the Gentiles. That's why the Jews were so shocked when Paul said, I'm going to the Gentiles. They could never imagine God going to the Gentiles. That's why they rejected the message of Paul. Because he said, God was giving salvation to the Gentiles. If you don't understand this, you'll be in a lot of trouble. Tongues are never seen outside of this Acts period in church history. You study church history. They're never there. The gift of tongues are never there. Never. Maybe in a cult here, in a cult there, sometimes you would hear a hint of the so-called gift of tongues, which uh, you find today, which is similar to what you find today. Gibberish. But the gift of tongues as it's found in the Bible is never found again after the Acts period. That's because God was temporarily finished with Israel. And now God has finished with Israel when Jesus came, remember what he said, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel, not for the Gentiles. He went, he preached to them, he was rejected by them. In the book of Acts, in the first seven chapters, God uh, sent his apostles to witness to the Jews. What did they do? How did they respond? They responded by stoning Stephen to death. In Acts chapter 8, you find the first Gentile being saved. Uh, that is the Ethiopian eunuch. In Acts chapter 9, you have the apostle to the Gentiles being saved, the apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 10, you have another Gentile and his family being saved, Cornelius and his family. Acts chapter 11 onwards, you find the preaching uh, of the gospel going to the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 15, the meeting of the apostles, it was decided God is visiting uh, the Gentiles as well. So they also should be saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happened in the book of Acts. It was a transition. God started dealing with the Jews. Then he started dealing with the Gentiles later on. That's why the gift of tongues was no longer needed. Because God turned to the Gentiles. The Jews require a sign. Not the Gentiles. The Gentiles seek after wisdom. Always remember that. And the gifts and the signs and the wonders had all ceased. Let me give you just two quick examples. And then very soon we will finish with this study. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. 1 Timothy 5.23 says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. What happened? The greatest apostle who could perform 
some really unimaginable miracles, is recommending medicine to Timothy for his infirmities and stomach problems. Why couldn't he say just pray for healing with faith and you'll be uh, healed? That's because the gift of healing was already waning away. It was already being stopped by God. If you don't really trust what uh, I have said about this verse, now look at 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 20. These are the words of Paul. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. What? Paul could not heal Trophimus, so he left him at Miletum sick? What is happening? The greatest healer after the Lord Jesus Christ was the Apostle Paul. And he could not heal his friend. He left him sick in that place and he moved ahead. What was happening? The gifts were waning. They were going away from the church. Because God had now turned to the Gentiles. The Jews require a sign. Remember that. The gospel of the kingdom was preached to the Jews. And it was accompanied with signs and wonders. Once the Jews rejected Jesus Christ, God turned to the Gentiles. And now to the Gentiles, the gospel of the kingdom is not preached. The gospel of the grace of God is preached. And it doesn't need any signs and miracles uh, accompanying that preaching. It's very, very simple to understand. In Acts chapter 7, God rejected the Jews in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 13, God rejected the Jews in Asia Minor. In Acts chapter 18, God rejected the Jews in Europe. And then in Acts chapter 28, God rejected the Jews in Rome, which is a type of the world. So that means God worldwide rejected the Jews. And he ceased to exclusively deal with the Jews. And he went to the Gentiles. Look at what Paul says in Acts 28, the very last chapter of the book of Acts. Acts 28, 26 to 28. Saying, go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have their clothes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Who are they and them? Israel. Go back and read the context. Verse 28. Be it known therefore unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. These were the last words of the Holy Spirit to the Jews in Rome, a type of the world. And then God moved on completely to the Gentiles at the end of the Acts period around 62 AD. That's why the gift of tongues, the signs, the wonders, the mighty deeds all ceased because... God was not dealing exclusively with the Jews because the Jews require a sign. By the way, 1 Corinthians was written in the Acts time period. Paul wrote it around 57 AD. 57 AD. It was quite uh, late that he wrote this book towards the end of his life. But still, it was within the Acts period. So that tells you why they were still exercising the gift of tongues in Corinth. It does not mean it applies to you and me today in this age that we are living in. Once God stopped his dealings with Israel, the sign gifts also ceased. As I've said, in the entire Bible, the, uh, you find only three times that anybody spoke in tongues. Acts 2 and Acts 10 and Acts 19. If tongues are a sign and the Jews require a sign then all three times it must be for the Jews look at it go back and look at it in Acts 2 we have already seen they are all Jews so they were able to speak in tongues to convince many people to believe Jesus is the Messiah 3,000 people got saved in Acts chapter 10 now this is where you might be a little confused why did the Gentiles Cornelius and his family speak in tongues because the Jews require a sign. You say, what do you mean? Remember, Peter and the men who were with him were all Jews. They were all Jews. And they went with the mindset that they were going to the home of an unclean man. Because God does not accept Gentiles. To the Jews, Gentiles are dogs. Really, that's what they believed. That the Gentiles are dogs. Remember what Jesus said to the Syrophoenician woman? It is not good to take 
the food that belongs to the children and cast them to dogs. The Jews looked at Gentiles as if they were dogs and God had to change the mind of Peter and the other Jews and they had to believe that salvation is going to the Gentiles as well. That's why God gave that vision to Peter in the first place. That great sheet descending with all sorts of animals and God says arise Peter kill and eat. What does Peter say? I have never touched an unclean thing in my life. Why are you asking me to eat unclean animals? In order for the Jews to believe that now salvation is going to the Gentiles, God had to allow these Gentiles to speak in tongues so that the Jews would see that the same gift they had received had also been given to the Gentiles. And they would say, yes, God indeed has visited the Gentiles and they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what is the evidence? The evidence is that they also spoke in tongues just like we did. And that's exactly what Peter and the others do in Acts chapter 11. The, the, the Jewish believers in Jesus Christ are very angry with Peter. They say, why did you go to the Gentiles? And then Peter had to tell them, look, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. How do you know, Peter? Because when we preached, they received, they got saved, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues, in other languages. So there, the Jews were present. Acts chapter 2, there were Jews. Acts chapter 10, there were Jews. In Acts chapter 19, it's very clear that the people uh, who spoke in tongues after Paul laid their, uh, his hands on them were the disciples of John. That means they were Jews. It's always, all three times, only three times in the entire Bible, someone speaks in tongues. And all three times it was for the Jews because the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks, that is Gentiles, seek after wisdom. In Acts chapter 19, also they were the disciples of John the Baptist and they were Jews, brethren. That means the so-called tongues that charismatic preachers and Christians are speaking in today are counterfeit tongues. The healings that they are performing are counterfeit healings because the power to heal seized with the apostles and their immediate converts who were ministering to the Jews. Once God stopped dealing with the Jews, no more healing, no more visions, no more prophecies, especially because the Bible has been completed, the New Testament was completed, no need for any prophecy, no need for any tongues because Christianity spread to the whole world and uh, the people of every nation would preach to their own people. There was no need of any supernatural ability to speak in another language. But still, in spite of all this, these people go on claiming that they have the power to heal. They have uh, the ability to speak in tongues, which is nothing but gibberish. This is a counterfeit church. It belongs to the devil. It is certainly controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. And that's what you need to recognize. What is behind the charismatic movement what is behind the charismatic movement is the Roman Catholic Church, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What is behind the Roman Catholic Church is the great imitator of Jesus Christ himself. And for you who do not still understand this, this connection between the Roman Catholic Church and the charismatic movement, let me say this and close that, do you know that there is a charismatic movement within the Roman Catholic Church? Yes, there is. You can look it up and you will find it. In some of these Roman Catholic churches, they have changed the way they sing. They copy the charismatics in their singing style, which is again another counterfeit music and counterfeit singing of the devil in the charismatic church. Yes, even music can be controlled by the devil in another Bible study. The Lord willing, we will talk about it. But the charismatic churches have adopted charismatic music. Now the charismatic, uh, the Roman Catholic fathers, I'm sorry, uh, have claimed to have the power to heal people. They are speaking in tongues. They are emphasizing experience about the truth of the scriptures. What's happening? Why are the Roman Catholics imitating the charismatics? That's because they're all the same. That's why. The Roman Catholic Church, the bride of Satan, the great counterfeit church of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the chaste virgin, is damning the souls of millions of people into hell by putting emphasis on all these things which will not save the souls of sinners. 
tongues, healings, visions, prophecies, and all these kind of things. Be careful, Christian. Be very careful, or else you will fall prey to this nonsense. Do not think for a moment, if I attack the teachings of the charismatic church, I am attacking the Holy Spirit. That's what they will make you believe. No, not at all. As I've said, their Jesus is other Jesus. Their spirit is another spirit. Their gospel is another gospel. Their church is another church, not the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you need to be very careful. My prayer is that the Lord will help you, if you have never seen this truth, to see it now. That both the Roman Catholic Church and the Charismatic Church uh, are together in many, many things. And together they are damning the souls of millions of people to hell. If you are an unsaved person, now would be a very good time for you to believe that Jesus died for you in your place upon the cross and took your sins upon himself and paid the price for the penalty of your sins. He did. He shed his blood on the cross to cleanse you from all your sins. He died, he was buried and he rose up again. You must realize that you uh, cannot save yourself with your good works. You cannot save yourself by obeying your religion, whatever it may be. You cannot save yourself with your education. Nothing in this world and no one in this world can save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus claimed to have this exclusive power to save the souls of sinners. Because only he is God manifest in the flesh who came down to the earth who lived a holy, sinless life, who died on the cross for you, was buried and rose up again. Now, if you believe it and trust him as your savior, you can be saved <clears throat> and God will forgive you of all your sins and give you eternal life so that when you die or when Jesus Christ returns, you will be with Jesus Christ forever and ever. God bless you.